Welcome. Uh, I'm Robin Niblett, the Director and Chief Executive of Chatham House. And I want to welcome you very much to this special event on new ideas for NATO 2030. Um, and I must welcome both the Chatham House members who are joining us today and also the many others who are joining us um, from around the world, I think is the best way of putting it. And I also want to welcome very strongly Jens Stoltenberg, the Secretary General of NATO, uh, for this uh, uh, important meeting where we're going to be unveiling some exciting new ideas for NATO through to 2030. Before I sort of uh, get into the meat of the conversation, we've got a lot to get through in very little time. Um, let me just remind you all this meeting is on the record. Um, it is being recorded and live streamed on the NATO website and its LinkedIn page. Um, so uh, remember that this is not a Chatham House rule meeting. Um, please, when we get to the moments for Q&A, uh, use the Q&A function. Do not use the raise hand or the chat functions, uh, which are there. I'll be asking the questions in the little window we have uh, on that point of view. And if you're watching on live stream, please use the Slido function. Go to Slido and enter the event code NATO2030. This information hopefully will be supplied to you, but NATO2030 is the event code on Slido if you want to submit a question to the NATO Secretary General. Um, and before we uh, absolutely kick off here, um, because we're gonna have quite a complex meeting with uh, some remarks from the Secretary General, uh, we will have a little bit of time for Q&A. We're then gonna get the NATO 2030 young leaders um, to uh, submit some of their recommendations and share them with the Secretary General, get a little bit of feedback uh, before we go to a, a hackathon, uh, which is a policy hackathon. Uh, it's gonna run for two hours from 4.15 p.m. GMT through to 6.15 GMT. Uh, the culm culmination of one week involving students from 10 universities all coming up with their exciting ideas for a sort of pitch for purpose for the future of NATO through 2030. Um, uh, you know, ahead of all of that big program, um, I'm hoping that by this time we're going to be able to know where you are coming from um, and that those of you who are joining us on the live stream uh, are going to be able to show us uh, a little bit and put it up maybe on the highlight screen as I can see it's coming up here, where most of you are from. Let's have a look. Um, now, I'm assuming there's a big chunk from Belgium here, although I see the numbers changing as we look probably because there's quite a few NATO folks uh, uh, listening in on this as well. I'm not sure it's entirely Belgian citizens, but we can see as one would uh, perhaps expect also uh, some heavy focus from uh, Lithuania, that Baltic space. Um, in any case, I'm not gonna uh, interpret it too much. Glad to see the US and the UK well represented uh, and Germany as well. So you can see we've got a really diverse group of countries uh, represented at this meeting. Um, what I'm going to do, as I said now, is uh, invite in NATO Secretary General to share some opening remarks. Um, I will simply say this is his first major policy speech of 2021. And from a Chatham House perspective, let me say, Secretary General, we're thrilled that you would be giving it uh, here with us in collaboration with Chatham House, not least because this is our first major policy speech, international policy speech of our second century which started in January, 2021. So I think the timing, uh, uh, Secretary General, is fantastic. I think you all know uh, uh, Secretary General was appointed back in 2014. He is now into his second term, which will run through to 2022. He's really, over, um, uh, I think it is widely recognized, a deep transformation of the NATO Alliance at a time of changing threats, changing actors, changing challenges, has brought his experience as former Prime Minister of Norway finance minister and former UN special envoy on climate change, somebody who understands, I think, the diversity of risks facing this world, um, uh, joining us now. So Secretary General, fantastic to have you with us. Thank you for joining this great audience. Look forward to your remarks. And then I'm going to engage you with your uh, young panel of young NATO 2030 leaders. Over to you first. Thank you so much, uh, Robin. It's great to see you again. And good morning, North America, and good afternoon, uh, Europe. Welcome everyone. Let me start by thanking Chatham House. For over 100 years, your intellectual leadership has helped to guide governments, societies and leaders through constant global change. 
So you are therefore the ideal partner for today's event. Like many of you here today, I became interested in politics at an early age. Because I wanted to work for a better and safer world. I grew up during the Cold War, always aware of the risk of a nuclear conflict. So I protested against nuclear weapons and celebrated uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Cold War. For so many centuries, conflict was a constant companion in Europe. But since the creation of NATO more than 70 years ago, peace has been preserved and freedom maintained. The nations of Europe and North America have stood together, pledged to defend each other, to protect our peoples and to uphold our values. That pledge remains, but the world has changed and it has become much more unpredictable than when I was growing up. <clears throat> we don't just face one clear challenge, but multiple complex challenges. From pandemics to infodemics, from climate change to the disruptive technologies. And the lines between peace and war, civilian and military, state and non-state, are increasingly blurred. To continue adapting our alliance to this unpredictability, we launched the NATO 2030 initiative. This is why we are all here today. And why I asked a group of 14, 14 young leaders from across the alliance to advise me on NATO's future. In addition, students from 10 universities have been competing all week in NATO's first policy hackathon. And later you will have the chance to vote for the most innovative ideas. Today's event is about generating fresh new thinking about the future of NATO. We have asked you to look at five areas that are vital to our security. First, we asked you to look at how we can continue to protect our values and the rules-based order that has brought us peace and prosperity for so many decades. These values, freedom, democracy, the rule of law, are not abstract notions. They are at the very core of who we are. And we got a shocking reminder of this as we watched the attack on the United States Congress just a month ago. That was not only an assault on the heart of American democracy, but also on the core values of NATO. President Biden's inauguration on those same steps just two weeks later showed the strength of democracy. It also showed that we must never take our democracy for granted. The second area we ask you to look at is resilience. Increasingly, our security does not just rely on strong militaries. We need strong, resilient societies and economies too. We need more robust infrastructure, transport and telecommunications, including 5G and undersea cables. And we need safer and more diverse supply lines for fuel, food and medical supplies. We must do more to identify vulnerabilities and mitigate risks and hold each other to account. For example, by screening foreign investment, ownership and control of our critical infrastructure and assets. Because these are not just economic decisions. They are crucial for our ability to protect ourselves. We should never trade short-term economic benefit for our long-term security interest. The third area we asked you to look at was NATO's role in the world. NATO is and will remain a regional alliance of Europe and North America. But the challenges we face are more and more global. So we need a global outlook. 
we need to work even more closely with like-minded partners across the globe to develop a community of democracies like Australia, Japan, New Zealand and South Korea. And also to reach out to potential new partners like Brazil and India. To contribute to global peace and security, NATO must continue to work with partner nations to protect civilians in war zones and counter terrorist operations. NATO is a standard setter in these areas because for NATO, national security and human security must always go hand in hand. Fourth, we asked you to look at the security implications of climate change. Global warming, warming puts pressure on people and resources and makes the world a more dangerous place. Climate change affects our security and makes it harder for our military forces to keep us safe. Therefore, we all have a responsibility to do more to combat climate change. Which is why we are looking at how NATO can play our part in reaching net zero. Finally, we asked to look at emerging and disruptive technologies. For decades, our technological edge has kept our military strong. But today, it is being challenged by countries like Russia and China. So we must continue to innovate and invest in the right forces with the right capabilities to remain competitive in a more competitive world. For all five areas, the ideas you put forward today will help me finalize my recommendations to NATO leaders at our summit later this year. Your generation has the greatest stake in our future, so it is essential that your voices are heard. This is your chance to shape our agenda for NATO 2030. So I thank you for your energy, your ideas and your optimism today. We must be bold. Together we can make NATO stronger. To keep our nation safe on both sides of the Atlantic. In a fast changing world. I very much look forward to hearing from you. And I wish all the hackathon teams the very best of luck. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary General. Thanks for those uh, uh, very important remarks for laying out the scope of the challenge that you set to the NATO young leaders to look at the, the diversity of the challenges and risks, which, as you described, cover a spectrum that no longer has some of perhaps the simplicity of the Cold War challenges that faced uh, NATO in that time. Um, we want to draw in some questions right now, and we've got uh, about 15 minutes to be able to get uh, some questions over to you and, and points back. Um, what I wanted to do, though, if I may, is start with a question on behalf of one of the young members of the Common Futures Conversation, a, a network actually which Chatham House has helped convene uh, with the support of the Robert Bosch Foundation and a number of other organizations um, that looks that brings young Europeans and young Africans together to think about their common future. And uh, Olela Khan Ojumu um, from Nigeria wanted me to pose the following question to you. So if I could kick off with this one. And his question goes as follows. Um, Africa has a security challenge which needs both internal and external support. NATO has already established a working relationship with the African Union. What role will NATO play in curbing the insecurity that has been plaguing the continent beyond 2021. Um, could you share any thoughts on that specific question first, please, sir? For NATO, it is extremely important to work uh, with partners in our neighborhood. And uh, Africa is a neighbor of uh, uh, the North Atlantic uh, uh, region where NATO uh, operates. Um, uh, NATO is and will remain a, a regional alliance for North America and, uh, and, um, and Europe. But of course, uh, what happens in Africa matters for our security. So therefore, we strongly believe in the importance of working with partners, uh, uh, countries, but also organizations like the African Union. And as you just uh, alluded to, NATO has already established a 
cooperation with the African Union. We also work with the UN. So we help, for instance, with training um, of peacekeeping forces, capacity building, uh, how to deal with uh, things like uh, improvised explosive devices, uh, how to protect uh, um, peacekeeping uh, troops in their missions and operations, including in, uh, in uh, Africa. Uh, then we also have some partner nations um, uh, through something we call the Mediterranean Dialogue. We work with, uh, with countries like uh, Tunisia, Morocco, uh, other partners in Northern Africa. I also recently met the president of Mauritania. Uh, we are, of course, concerned about the situation in, uh, uh, in the Sahel region. And NATO allies are um, helping, supporting uh, 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 to fight uh, international terrorism, uh, different terrorist groups in the region. Uh, and we, in NATO, we're also looking into how we can step up and do more, both when it comes to exercises, capacity building, and uh, and uh, training. So in NATO, we all we often say that when our neighbors are uh, uh, stable, we are more secure. So I think it is extremely important that we work with Africa, with African Union, with countries in Africa, and in particular our partners, uh, to uh, uh, support, to help uh, 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 the efforts to fight instability uh, and to fight international terrorism and, uh, and work in other ways with, uh, with uh, African countries. That's, no, thank you very much. And uh, I think with your commentary about the cascading effects uh, of climate insecurity, we could easily see uh, uh, the relationship uh, with African countries and that focus growing. I'm just going to turn to a couple of questions that I see here. Uh, we've got a huge amount coming in already, as we might imagine, into our Q&A. But um, Andre Podradza, if I can stick with the sort of uh, international NATO part of your uh, remarks that you, that you gave here, NATO in the world, your third topic. He says here, um, which NATO model are we heading towards, given the strategic rivalry between the US and China, Will NATO be more of a global alliance or will collective defense against threats, for example, from Russia, continue to be central? Um, uh, we know certainly during the Trump administration, Secretary General, there quite a bit of emphasis about turning towards uh, the risks from China, which I think you did allude to in your remarks. But do you see, uh, as he asked this question, is there going to be a new model where NATO becomes part of that US-China rivalry? We don't regard uh, China as an adversary, um, and there are opportunities uh, connected to the rise of China. The strong economic growth has helped to uh, lift hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, and, uh, and uh, of course the strong economic growth in China over decades have also been important for uh, NATO allies, uh, important for our export markets, uh, our, our economies. Having said that, there are some, there are, at the same time, there are some challenges for our security. Uh, soon, China will have the biggest economy in the world. Uh, China is an authoritarian society which does not share our values. We see that in the way they crack down on uh, democracy, human rights activists in Hong Kong, how they... Uh, deal with minorities or, or oppress minorities in, uh, in, uh, in their own country, like the Uyghurs, uh, and also the way they have threatened uh, uh, Taiwan or the way they, they, they actually behave, for instance, in the South China uh, Sea. Um, China is also now investing heavily in new modern military capabilities, uh, including new nuclear capabilities. Uh, and China is present uh, in, in NATO countries, um, investing heavily in infrastructure. We had a, an important discussion about 5G, and I think we have seen a convergence of views within NATO, uh, uh, realizing that, for instance, 5G network is crucial, not only for our economies, but also for the resilience of our societies, and fundamentally about the security of our uh, societies. And NATO is a unique platform to bring together North America and Europe uh, to address these challenges, because in security, uh, size matters. Uh, and uh, of course, NATO is important for Europe, but the NATO is also important for America, and especially addressing the, con the security consequences of the rise of China, it matters for the United States that they have 29 friends and allies in, uh, in, uh, in NATO. Let me just end by saying that, for me, this is not 
about making NATO a global alliance. NATO will remain an alliance with members from Europe and North America. And our collective security guarantees, they apply for North America and Europe. But the threats we face in this region, they are becoming more and more global. Terrorism, cyber, space, uh, and the rise of China, these are global challenges that affect our regional security. Therefore, being a regional alliance, we need a global approach, and this is also what we address in NATO 2030. Well, thank you for, the, for that important uh, distinction, as you said, uh, uh, a North Atlantic alliance in terms of collective security guarantees, but an alliance that has global uh, interests. Um, there are a number of questions. I'm sort of going to grouping them together, but uh, Gigi uh, Alsebrook in particular, along with others, asking about the dilemma I'm sure you're having to deal with, uh, with two key members, Greece and Turkey, uh, facing quite a serious a uh, set of disputes and disagreements, including uh, deployment of, of vessels and so on in the Eastern Mediterranean. How are you as the Secretary General managing this challenge? Uh, and uh, how do you see the way forward, to put it bluntly, um, given uh, both countries' central role uh, for a strong NATO in the future? It is well known, and it's actually uh, part of what we have also addressed in NATO at uh, several uh, occasions, that there are differences uh, between uh, NATO allies, and in this case uh, between uh, two important NATO allies, Greece and uh, Turkey. Both Greece and Turkey are uh, uh, valued uh, allies, uh, but they disagree on some uh, uh, issues, including uh, uh, related to the uh, Eastern Mediterranean. Um, I think that NATO's role is to provide a platform to address these differences. Uh, when we disagree, when there are differences, we need to, uh, to, to, to convene and to sit down and to have open and, uh, and uh, honest discussions about uh, the differences. And that's exactly what we have done uh, um, when it comes to, for instance, the situation in the Eastern Mediterranean. And therefore, we have been able to establish at NATO uh, what we call a de-confliction mechanism, and that's actually a military lines of communications, uh, a hotline, uh, military technical talks between the Greek and the Turkish uh, uh, military uh, and personnel here, here at NATO uh, in Brussels, and by that reducing the risks of incidents, accidents uh, between ships, planes uh, in the Eastern Med uh, coming from Turkey and, uh, and Greece. This is important because in the 1990s, where we had similar differences, um, uh, tensions between uh, Greece and Turkey, we actually saw that that led to casualties, to, uh, to serious um, incidents uh, 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 that, uh, that uh, led to, to actually fatalities and loss of uh, personnel. Uh, we need to prevent that from happening again, and that's the reason why we have established this deconfliction mechanism at NATO. This has also helped to pave the way uh, for uh, Greece and Turkey to sit down and um, restart what they call exploratory talks on the underlying uh, 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 disagreements. Uh, so yes, there are concerns, but I think the most important thing NATO can do is to try to find ways to step by step, not only complain about the concerns and express concerns, but also find a positive approach, a way forward, and over the last weeks and months, we have seen uh, some important steps in the right direction, proving, proving that NATO has an important role uh, to play also when allies disagree, as they do, for instance, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Thank you. Um, we have quite a few questions coming in on the cyber question as well. I'm just looking here. Obviously, you highlighted this as, I think, your uh, uh, fifth or one of your key topics uh, in your list for the uh, uh, young group to focus on. And I can see John Paul Rosario has asked uh, a question about whether NATO, uh, having created its cyberspace uh, operations center in Belgium, um, uh, there's the big discussion about broadening the Article 5 commitment to include significant uh, cyber attacks. And he asks, uh, what do you consider a significant uh, cyber attack? Um, uh, I think there are a couple other questions about, about cybersecurity, but let's focus on that one first, if we could. Um, how are you going to be able to keep that uh, predictability, the deterrent effect of NATO alive in this cyber era in particular? So we will never uh, give a potential adversary or enemy the privilege of telling them exactly when we're going to trigger Article 5. That's for us to decide uh, based on a concrete assessment of uh, a concrete situation. 
but what we have clearly stated is that is that um, a cyber attack uh, might trigger Article 5. So if we uh, assess it, deem it as serious enough, then we can trigger Article 5. Meaning that then we have all NATO allies um, stepping up uh, and protecting uh, the ally or the, those allies that are under uh, a cyber attack. We can respond in cyber, but we can also respond in other domains. That's up to us to decide. The whole purpose of deterrence is to prevent an attack. And, uh, and the success of NATO has been that we have been able to prevent conflict. The purpose of NATO is not to fight the war. The purpose of NATO is to prevent the war. Uh, and we have done so successfully for decades. Um, then I think we have to re recognize that in cyber, the line between peace and war is more blurred. And that's a, one of the challenges we face, that before it was, uh, it, it was easy to define whether we were at war or whether we were uh, uh, in, uh, living in, in, in peace. Now that with terrorism, cyber, hybrid threats, that line is bl more blurred, and that's, that in itself uh, is a challenge. We have established cyber as an operational domain, uh, and we have also developed what we call national cyber effects, uh, sometimes also referred to as offensive cyber. And NATO allies use that uh, in a very effective way, for instance, in combating Daesh, ISIS in Iraq and Syria. Uh, we were able to take down uh, many of their cyber uh, um, um, capabilities uh, that were important for them, recruiting, spreading their propaganda, uh, financing, uh, uh, so offensive cyber or national cyber effects uh, are also part of what NATO has developed over the last years and, uh, and, and we continue to strengthen our cyber defences. Thank you. Um, a couple of, uh, we've got another four minutes between the two of us, so Secretary General, just so you know where we are in the flow. Um, and thank you everyone for all the questions. I don't know how many more we'll be able to take, but uh, I've got a few left here. I want to make sure we touch on maybe a little bit traditional but uh, Anastasia asks the very obvious question, um, uh, what mechanisms do you foresee NATO developing in its 2030 agenda to contain continued Russian aggression? Full stop. Credible deterrence. Uh, and that's exactly what we have done for 70, more than 70 years and we will continue to do uh, so. Um, and we have done that uh, over the last years also by significantly strengthening our collective defense, the biggest reinforcement of collective defense uh, since the end of the Cold War, with the deployment of combat ready battle groups to the eastern part of the alliance in the Baltic countries and Poland, uh, with increased readiness of our forces, with a, a, a new command structure, and of course, with the fact that all NATO allies, after cutting defense spending for many years, all NATO allies have uh, since 2014 increased defense spending. So. The adaptation of NATO, the, the, the fact that we are modernizing our military capabilities, that's the best way to make sure that no ally is, uh, is suffering any attack from any direction, including, of course, also from Russia. Um, two more questions. Paul Newman asks, again, a very big and important question. How do you see the arrival of the Biden administration uh, affecting the future of NATO and the kind of plans that you're developing? Do you see some fundamental change? I welcome uh, the new Biden administration. I'm looking forward to working with um, uh, President Biden and his, uh, his security team. Uh, I have um, spoken with uh, President Biden um, twice since elections, and he has expressed strongly his personal commitment to NATO. I have worked with him in his previous capacities, and I know that uh, President Biden is a strong personal supporter of the transatlantic bond, and he knows NATO uh, very well. Uh, I also spoken with um, Secretary Blinken uh, and Secretary, um, uh, the new Defense Secretary uh, and uh, Austin, and they also express their strong personal commitment. So I think that uh, the new Biden administration uh, provides a unique opportunity to re-energize, to revitalize, to rebuild uh, NATO, and uh, and I look forward to welcoming President Biden to the, the NATO summit here in Brussels later this year. And maybe one last question, I think, uh, if this is what we've got time for now. Um, uh, Daphne Yanug has uh, asked a question about uh, environmental threats. In fact, there's a couple of questions about environmental issues here. Um, for environmental threats, uh, is NATO going to have to rethink its value structure um, and its habits and its customs? Um, and can NATO play a role in that redefinition of what security is 
Uh, Tanji Morgan asks a similar question. Uh, climate change is not just a, a climate threat, it is driven and is affecting biodiversity uh, in particular, and that also has security implications. So how inventive uh, can NATO be in rethinking these environmental dimensions of future security? How much of a role can NATO play in that space? So climate change is a serious issue for many uh, uh, reasons. One of them is that climate change affects our security. Uh, climate change is a crisis multiplier and uh, therefore uh, it matters for NATO and therefore uh, NATO has to uh, address the security consequences of climate change. One of the reasons I want uh, I, I, I want to, to, as part of NATO 2030, to launch a process where NATO um, is um, adapting, developing a new strategic concept is that actually in the existing strategic concept we agreed back in 2010, climate change is hardly mentioned. It's mentioned one word, tiny uh, reference to climate change. I think that in a new strategic concept for NATO, which we hopefully then will start to develop when we meet at the NATO leaders meeting later this year, uh, climate change has to play a much more prominent and important role. NATO uh, should do its part, uh, partly to look into how we can reduce emissions from military operations. Uh, we know that uh, uh, heavy battle tanks or, or fighter jets and, uh, and uh, naval ships, they, they consume a lot of uh, fossil fuel and emit uh, greenhouse or uh, 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 CO2, greenhouse gases, CO2. Uh, uh, and therefore, we knew, have to look into how we can reduce those emissions um, by alternative fuels, um, solar panels, uh, 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 other ways of, uh, of running our emissions. Um, that will be good for the climate, reduce the emissions of uh, uh, greenhouse gases, but it will also increase the resilience of our troops and military operations. Because we know that one of the vulnerabilities in any military operation is the supply of fossil fuels. Long supply lines, vulnerable supply lines, has always through decades been a critical uh, vulnerability for many different military operations. So if we can make us less dependent on that, we are uh, both reducing uh, emissions, but at the same time increasing the military effectiveness, uh, the resilience of our troops. So, so we, we are working on that with different projects. Uh, to look into how we can make our militaries greener and uh, and uh, and and less dependent on on fossil fuels, so we will address climate change. Um, we are in the process of stepping up uh, in that area, and uh, for me, it is a privilege to have my background as UN envoy on climate change, and then bring that that background into my current uh, responsibility as Secretary General of NATO. Thank you very much for those answers. And actually, in particular, the one you made at the end there about actually uh, potentially being more resilient um, as, a, uh, as an alliance uh, by actually addressing the climate challenge, because otherwise we're going to be facing uh, enemies who may be ignoring these issues. Look, we're going to move now uh, to engage the, the voices of the NATO young leaders. First, let's get a, um, uh, a quick video up so we can introduce the whole process that you launched, Secretary General, as part of your NATO 2030 vision. Please, uh, let's run the video and then we'll engage in conversation. Video first. I would like to hear your views, to have your ideas, your proposals of how NATO can remain strong. Alice Pilangalon, French. My name is Don Cedar and I have a Dutch nationality. My name is Martin Dimitrov. I come from Bulgaria. My name is Corey Flesser. I am from the United States. My name is Andrea Fierro-Lieu I'm from Spain. I'm Amri Mafedon and I'm British. Hi, my name is Gude Jensen and I am from Kiel, Northern Germany. My name is Katrina Kertisova and I'm from Slovakia. My name is Tanja Lacic and I'm a Romanian living in Belgium. My name is Jan Lukacevic. 
I'm a European coming from Czech Republic. My name is Claudia Manejan and I'm from Italy. My name is Marv Steinberg. I'm Latvia. Hi guys. My name is Ulrich. I'm a Danish national living in Copenhagen. My name is Ken Long and I'm a proud 31 year old Canadian. I assume we have introduced all of the NATO young leaders there. Um, in which case, I'm going to uh, uh, come back in and uh, engage now in the next part of our conversation. Um, and I noticed that the NATO Secretary General was wearing a tie during that, um, that little video, but he has definitely got uh, in with uh, the space of our uh, NATO young leaders now um, in this part of the conversation. So um, what I'm going to do is uh, uh, introduce, first of all, Alice billon who who um, conveniently, from my point of view, is a research associate at Chatham House in our Europe program. She is one of the 14 uh, NATO uh, 2030 young leaders, as you saw introduced just there. In her case, she was nominated by the European Leadership Network. And Alice is going to kick off and uh, at least kick off this process and introduce the first of our um, six speakers who will be engaging in conversation. Alice, over to you. Thank you, Robin. And on behalf of the group, thanks to you, Secretary General, for asking us to fit into your thinking for NATO 2030. I think it's fair to say that faced with the multiple and complex challenges which you just outlined in your speech, defending the one billion citizens who live in NATO countries is a moving target. This is why we believe that NATO will need to deter, defend, and provide security differently by 2030. Of course, NATO should firmly guard its strength with an enduring focus on deterrence and keeping the alliance militarily strong, as well as a renewed commitment to allied solidarity and democratic principles. But to meet all the new challenges, NATO will also need to embrace the change by combining a more holistic understanding of security with a more balanced transatlantic core and a truly global mindset. As you'll see, our report is made of both moonshot ideas and specific recommendations. The report doesn't aim to be a comprehensive strategy. Instead, we decided to focus on a couple of key issues which we believe should feature more prominently in NATO's work because they matter to the new security environment. So while being cautious to neither overextend NATO's mandate nor to over-securitize new policy areas, we argue that the Alliance can bring considerable added value by doing three things. First, by providing a space for political consultations among allies and with like-minded partners on issues ranging from economic coercion to cyber attribution. Second, by providing leadership on global issues such as climate security and space governance. And finally, by fostering a new mindset on crucial topics such as resilience or emerging technologies. My colleagues will now present to you some of our key recommendations. Let me first introduce Tanya Letzic, nominated by SIPA, the Center for European Policy Analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Adis, Secretary General. For us, resilience lies really at the heart of NATO's ability to defend and to deter in 2030. So let me share with you two key recommendations. First, we think NATO should become a resilience pathfinder. What does that mean? Well, it means that NATO has a greater role to play in helping allies achieve resilience across the board. Now, res resilience is a moving target, but we bring concrete ideas like a resilience barometer or a civil military strategy that can help NATO craft a security insurance policy for the crises of the 2030s. Now, for us, resilience is split across eight key domains. They range from the internal to the economic and from the defense to outer space. Now, second, we recommend a reform of the 2% defense spending target. We believe that what counts as a defense contribution in 2030 should be reimagined. We believe there's no better way to incentivize allies to spend on areas such as climate security, anti-hybrid warfare, or economic resilience than making it count as a contribution to our common defense. We, we believe that as NATO becomes a resilience pathfinder, it should also find the path towards responsibility rather than burden sharing. So any new metric should be inclusive of diverse contributions that, that strengthen our collective defense and our collective resilience. Thank you. Secretary General, you heard those uh, remarks uh, from Tanya and also from Alice. Do you have a question back in return to them or a comment you'd like to make? Over to you, sir. 
Yes, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Alice for the report uh, you and your group have uh, written because uh, that's a very uh, concise uh, and uh, concrete uh, report and you can be extremely proud of that input. And this is really an important input for me uh, as I uh, prepare uh, my recommendations, my proposals uh, for the heads of state and government uh, when they meet and then uh, uh, for them to make final decisions on how NATO can adapt, change, so uh, so we are as su successful in the future as we have been uh, since uh, our uh, foundation more than 70 years ago. Uh, so, so many, many thanks. Then uh, to uh, uh, Tanya, I will say that uh, resilience uh, has been, I think, underestimated for many, many years because uh, the focus has been on military strength. And of course, military strength is important. Uh, we need modern military capabilities. Um, but unless uh, we have strong societies, we will not be able to have strong uh, uh, defense forces. And, um, and therefore, everything related to resilience uh, has... Uh, become much more important for NATO allies. Uh, and I like the idea you have about NATO as a resilience path, pathfinder and how we need to constantly develop uh, is a moving target, develop the aims and the goals and the guidelines we set for uh, resilience. Um, um, resilience is about, is, 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 that's about infrastructure, but also about uh, economic um, uh, considerations and economic resilience. And my question is actually about what do you think NATO should do when it comes to allied economic resilience in addition to what national governments and other international organizations are doing in that uh, area? Tanya, that's a quick question back to you. <laughs> yes, thank you, Secretary General, for this question. This is really one of the absolute key aspects that we have to figure out by 2030. The first commandment of resilience is that you're as strong as your weakest link. Now, today, in our hyper-globalized economy, weaponized economic power can be as damaging as traditional military power. Um, for example, if we think of supply chains that feed into both civil and military technology, if these are disrupted, um, this, is not, this is not going to only cause commercial losses, but can actually compromise NATO's defense posture. So these are ris risks that unfold at the nexus between security, economy, and technology. And we need to better understand them and address them in a holistic manner if we want to aim for economic resilience. Now, for this, our group recommends equipping NATO with geoeconomic tools. Now, the first step is to put geoeconomics and economic resilience firmly back on the agenda of NATO by resurrecting the economic committee. Now, this committee can help bring um, the right expertise within NATO and can help it coordinate with other geoeconomic relevant organizations such as the European Union. The second step would be taking interoperability, which is a concept at the core of how NATO functions, and extending it to economic resilience. By doing this, NATO could become a hub where allies could coordinate on export control regimes or on setting up robust yet aligned foreign investment screening mechanisms. What is clear is that economic coercion is a threat that NATO cannot ignore. Um, the key does lie in allied hands, but NATO can help them po can help point them at the right door. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Tanya. Um, I notice I will do some uh, Robin Niblett editorializing. Um, I also found your second recommendation on rethinking the two percent target a very interesting provocation, which I'm sure the Secretary General and and all of NATO will be considering very carefully. Um, but uh, I think the uh, focus right now on resilience obviously has been essential. We have two more blocks of uh, uh, recommendations and interaction with Secretary General. Keeping an eye on time, we're only running about three minutes behind, but just to remind you, the time is very tight. I'm gonna give the floor now to uh, two uh, more of the uh, seven uh, members of the NATO team, young leaders team who are presenting here. This is to Ulrich Smed, uh, who is with the office of the tech ambassador uh, of the Danish foreign ministry, who's been nominated by the Atlantic Council. And Katarina Ketisova, who is actually a, a fellow with the European Leadership Network and has been nominated by Globsec. So um, Ulrich, do you want to start off first and then to Katrina with your set of recommendations? 
Thank you, Robin. And thank you, for Secretary General, for allowing us to be here today. I'd like to highlight some of our group's thinking on values uh, and why this is important for NATO, especially following the events in recent years and months. So at home, uh, we believe allies should recommit to NATO's democratic values at the upcoming summit this year, to the rule of law, transparency, and division of powers. And operationally, we recommend leaders to have an annual discussion on democratic principles and work towards a written values pledge that would outline norms and responsibilities that allies strive to live by, to focus NATO's purpose and its commitments in the years to come. Because we need to be ready and credible in the eyes of citizens and for an era of geopolitical competition on values. Abroad, we think the alliance should become a beacon for democracy, to work together with democracies around the world. NATO's partnerships should be anchored in value-based principles on all levels, political, capacity building, and operational engagements. A decade ago, we might have taken for granted uh, that our values uh, and the direction of travel, but we can't afford to do that any longer. We need to lean in. And that's why NATO needs a global partnership for peace with an open horizon to the world and an active approach to partnerships with democratic nations, also outside the North Atlantic region. So in 2030, we would like to see NATO lead by example at home and abroad in a transparent and accountable way while building the democratic foundations for an era of global competition on values. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ulrich. And let me just say there was a very, I thought, important question we did not get to in the discussion earlier from Rachel Smith, who talked about precisely what you raised, the issue of values uh, and whether the Alliance um, can remain as committed and how it could do it. So thank you very much for those comments, Ulrich. Incredibly important. Katrina, you've got the uh, very big issue now um, of climate. Over to you. Thank you, Robin. And thank you, Secretary General. As we speak, uh, climate change is affecting our security environment. NATO can and should do more to climate proof its policies and operations. I'd like to offer three recommendations from our climate chapter. First, uh, we believe that NATO should capitalize on the current political momentum and put climate change at the top of the political agenda, starting with the next NATO summit. On that occasion, uh, the ally should publicly state that climate change is an existential threat and a fundamental security risk to the alliance. At the, national, at the North Atlantic Council, um, an informal caucus of allies that are already actively engaged in addressing climate security risks could be established to, fac to facilitate the exchange of lessons learned and best practices and to regularly brief the NAC. And ultimately, to echo what the Secretary General has already st stated, climate change should be embedded in an updated strategic concept. Second, NATO needs to better understand the conflict and instability implications of climate change. Partnerships at all levels, military cooperation programs and diplomatic tools are very important for NATO to understand uh, the underlying dynamics on the ground and to be prepared to respond in time. A combination of remote sensing, big data and AI, while improving intelligence sharing among allies, would increase NATO's capacity to better forecast future environmental shocks. And lastly, NATO should lead by example and act as a catalyzer for climate action by supporting allies in their emissions reduction and adaptation efforts. Thank you. Uh, Secretary General, um, some questions or comments back to, uh, to Ulrich and Katrina. So first, Ulrich, I very much agree that uh, values uh, is what NATO is actually founded on. So we need to stand up for those values. Um, uh, and, and NATO has, of course, uh, partly been important uh, in defending those values by defending those values against authoritarian uh, threats and challenges from the outside, especially during the Cold War with the Soviet Union. Um, then after the Cold War, NATO played a key role in spreading those values uh, through the enlargement. We have gone from 12 members to now 30 members, and just by that we have helped to spread democracy, the rule of law, individual liberty throughout uh, uh, Europe. 
But then thirdly, we need to be honest and, uh, and, uh, and uh, 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 also talk about the concerns that some allies express, uh, express about our own ability to live up to our own uh, values. And, and there I think that the most important thing NATO can do is that we are open, we are uh, frank, we, we, are, we, we provide a platform also for allies to express their concerns and to look into how we can make sure that we uh, uh, defend and protect the values also internally. I, I, I refer to the attack on the U.S. Capitol or the U.S. Congress building as one example of how we can never take these uh, values uh, for granted even inside our own countries. This is not the first time we uh, see concerns expressed about uh, values um, in our own countries, but I think that NATO's role is to address these concerns in an open and frank way, and I'm absolutely certain that, that will be also part of the NATO 2030 agenda. Then, uh, uh, on climate change, I also already said some words about climate change. But again, I really hope, and I, I not only hope, but I know that climate change will be on the top of the NATO agenda. Um, uh, it will be an important issue when uh, leaders meet and also as we start to develop a new strategic uh, concept. But climate change is so important that it's not enough only to talk and write about it. We need to do something concrete to reduce emissions. And therefore, uh, I also welcome your third element, uh, that we need to actually help allies to reduce their uh, own military emissions. And therefore, my question is that, uh, 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 do you think that NATO allies should set voluntary targets for reducing their emissions from military activities, military emissions? And uh, what more could we do to help to reduce emissions from uh, military? Thank you for that question. Um, I would say that before we speak about um, voluntary targets, um, the first step would be to help allies measure their military emissions. And once those are known and maybe made public, in the next step, uh, NATO could help allies set voluntary targets um, so they can reduce their emissions uh, in ways that do not compromise operational effectiveness. But there's more that NATO can, can do. Um, another step would be to set green targets for defense planning, and such targets could include a 25% fuel efficiency increase, uh, higher standards for military facilities, or cleaner equipment and support solutions. And to revert back uh, to our recommendation about a reformed 2% defense spending metric, we believe that the development of sustainable technologies, of green technology, should part form part of that reformed metric. Thank you very much uh, for that reply, um, Katrina, and for uh, keeping this conversation going. And we are um, moving again pretty well on time here, Secretary General. Um, what we're going to do now is come to the last third block, and we're going to get some opening remarks from Corey Flesser, um, uh, Women, Peace, Security Advisor at Booz Allen Hamilton, nominated by the German Marshall Fund uh, of the US, GMF. Um, we're going to hear from uh, Jan Lukacevic, research assistant uh, at the Czech Academy of Sciences, who was nominated by the Aspen Institute Europe. And we'll be hearing from Andrea Garcia Rodriguez, who is a research fellow at the Barcelona Center for National Affairs, CIDOB, uh, nominated by CyberSec. Um, Corey, can you kick off this section first, please, with your com uh, comments about partnerships and cooperation? Over to you. Thank you, Robin. Secretary General, I'll highlight two recommendations on partnerships. Our first recommendation aims to enhance cooperation between NATO and the European Union. The group acknowledges a deeper NATO-EU partnership would further cement the existing bonds within the Euro-Atlantic community and benefit both common members as well as single membership nations of both organizations. To streamline and elevate cooperation, the group recommends appointing a NATO special representative for NATO-EU relations. This special representative would be responsible for strengthening existing recognized areas of cooperation, as well as identifying new or underexplored areas. This could include emerging technologies, space governance, and climate security. Our second recommendation focuses on allied cohesion, unity, and coherence in NATO's engagement with partners in the Indo-Pacific. Our report highlights the increasing geopolitical importance of the Indo-Pacific region 
and the need to enhance Allied's collective understanding of China's regional activities and global influence. The group recommends establishing an alliance-wide approach to Indo-Pacific partnerships with a focus on political and practical cooperation with like-minded nations and multilateral organizations. NATO should engage in structured political consultations with key Indo-Pacific partners on topics that reflect shared areas of interest, such as economic security, freedom of navigation, and resilience. Such strategic engagement would help the Alliance achieve a more uniform understanding of the challenges posed by China and expand NATO's global network of democratic values-based partnerships. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Um, let me turn straight now to Jan Lukacevic uh, for his comments on emerging and disruptive technologies. Jan. Thank you. Uh, dear Secretary General, to keep the technological edge, NATO needs to change its mindset. Uh, in a rapidly evolving environment of emerging technologies, such as space technologies or biotech, NATO needs to take a proactive approach in their development and adoption. I'd like to highlight three recommendations here. Our first recommendation is to NATO to go digital. NATO should put more effort to fully digitize Euro-Atlantic political and military institutions. Efficient gathering and processing information from allied countries can greatly enhance the speed of our decision-making. Digitization enables the use of AI, machine learning, and quantum capabilities. These are also in a focal point of NATO innovation. Second, NATO should strive to identify new technologies early on, strive to accelerate their development and adopt them across the whole alliance. We propose the creation of a new agency focusing on emerging and disruptive technologies. We call it NATO Strive. In short, this ecosystem will encompass the early identification of emerging technologies and their further research and development. This will result in accelerated adoption and bridging the gap between the private sector, academia, and leadership of NATO allies. Our third recommendation suggests NATO being an ethical norm setter. A newly established ethical framework would enable NATO to set norms in the area of emerging technologies, allowing Alliance to protect and uphold its values in future. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Jan. Um, let me turn first uh, to you, Secretary General, to respond to the, those comments, any questions you might have back uh, to the group, and we'll get Andrea to reply. Over to you, Secretary General. So first to Corey, I, I, I totally agree that <clears throat> partnerships are important for uh, NATO. Uh, no single institution, no single country can manage uh, all the security challenges uh, we face uh, alone. So we need to work together. Uh, therefore, for instance, for NATO, it has been extremely important uh, to strengthen the cooperation with the European Union. And I'm glad to see that we have been able to lift the uh, cooperation between NATO and the European Union to unprecedented levels. Uh, I meet regularly with the EU leadership and we are constantly in dialogue with them uh, about how we can further strengthen. Just the fact that more than 90% of the people uh, in the EU live in a NATO country uh, illustrates the importance of uh, us working closely uh, together. Um, I also uh, agree with you uh, on the importance of trying to look into how we can further strengthen uh, cooperation, partnership with um, our partners in the Indo-Pacific uh, uh, region. Uh, we have four partners there all, already in um, South Korea, Japan, New Zealand and Australia. And I think also when we look at, that, at those partners, uh, we see that these are countries which are also important when it comes to standing up for them, our democratic values. And they are eager to work more closely with NATO. We are eager to work more closely with them. And uh, in the light of the rise of China, I think that the partnership in, in, the, in the Pacific uh, region becomes even more important. And we need to also uh, discuss, based on your recommendations, uh, how we can uh, further strengthen cooperation with like-minded uh, democracies around the world. Then technology, I, I, I think it's hard in a way to understand how much uh, new disruptive emerging technologies are changing the nature of warfare. 
um, I have read some books about the First World War and people didn't realize the uh, horrendous, the, the brutality of that war because they hadn't really taken into account the consequence, consequences of the Industrial Revolution for uh, war fighting. In, in, in one way, I think we risk doing the same mistake now, that artificial intelligence, facial recognition, autonomous weapon systems, uh, uh, quantum computing, and all of that combined, uh, it's not only changing our civilian societies, but it's also fundamentally changing uh, the way uh, conflicts will be uh, fought uh, uh, in, the, in the future. And, uh, and therefore, NATO needs, of course, to keep uh, maintain the technological edge uh, but we also need to look into how can we develop arms control uh, addressing new technologies. Arms control has traditionally been about counting warheads. Now it's about uh, having regulations of, uh, of uh, cyber, of algorithms, of a lot of other uh, areas where the normal counting of warheads doesn't work. So how do we apply arms control to disruptive emerging technologies? That's a big uh, chapter. And also when it comes to ethical dimensions, and there I think also NATO should be, as you also allude to, a, a standard setter. And this is a uncharted waters, and we should really have an open mind on how NATO can play a constructive role in addressing all these uh, challenges related to, uh, to technology. I have one question, is that now, or is, should I wait? You've got one more one more question coming to you from uh, or one more comment maybe in reply from Andrea. Andrea, over to you. Thank you very much, Secretary General, for your comments. I agree with you, and the group agrees uh, that certainly um, emerging and disruptive technologies is a very big topic, and the issue of partnerships is another big topic. And I would like to highlight two issues that you've mentioned in your comments. The first one is about arms control, and the second one is about ethics. We believe that by the creation of this new entity called NATO Strive, we could work towards these two issues. First of all, because if NATO guides um, globally the development of emerging and disruptive technologies, it can also guide the way it, they are developed. For that reason, we believe that the creation of a, an ethical framework that should guide this development of these new technologies should be a priority for the Alliance. Because not only through this NATO Strive agency, uh, NATO would be able to maintain its technological edge by seeking out and finding these technologies as well as the companies and the startups and the ecosystem itself that have the potential to develop them, but also by exporting these ideas of these like ethical EDT, ethical um, emerging disruptive technologies to the world and therefore reaffirming its uh, power as an ethical norm setter and also as a democratic giant. Thank you very much, and Andrea. Um, Secretary General, that brings us to the end of this section. I don't know if you wanted to make any last comment right now, otherwise I'm going to thank you and introduce the hackathon. But anything, any last comment from you, sir? I have one, one uh, also comment on, on this issue of, um, of this um, uh, a new entity you, 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 ha you have proposed, or, or both uh, Andrea and Jan uh, uh, mentioned, uh, uh, that we need a new entity to to deal with uh, disruptive and emerging technologies. I think that's an interesting idea. It's not for me now to conclude. I will consult with allies, with capitals, with leaders before I put forward my proposals for them. But uh, but I, but I, 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 I think that's an interesting idea because I think that we need to really look into how NATO can, can uh, deliver uh, when it comes to bringing allies together uh, in addressing uh, the importance of uh, new disruptive uh, emerging technologies. Um, one challenge we have is that traditionally new technologies were, was very much, were, were very much were developed by the military. Also everything from nuclear to the internet to G, uh, GPS has been developed by government uh, actors and often the military. Now very much of the technology is developed in the private sector. And of course, if we develop or establish a, a NATO uh, entity for uh, addressing emerging and uh, disruptive technologies, then we also need to look into how can we link that entity with the private sector, including with startups. So that, if there is time, that's my last question, is actually the link between a NATO entity on uh, technology 
and the crucial cooperation link with the private sector, including startups, which we know are so important for uh, new technologies. Thank you, Secretary General. I'm glad you, you brought that point in right at the end, because actually that was another of the questions we were unable to get to, which was the connection uh, with the private sector in one of the earlier points. So I'm glad you had an opportunity to uh, plug it at the end. Let me say uh, right now, um, having moderated quite a few meetings in my time as director of Chatham House, I thought that was one of the most content-rich, concentrated uh, dialogues I've had the privilege of moderating and witnessing. Um, huge thanks to our young NATO 2030 young leaders who uh, showed uh, many of us who are less young um, how to be able to uh, really put good ideas over in a thoughtful and organized way. Thank you, Secretary General, for making the time for inspiring and driving this process and all of your teams as well back in uh, at NATO. It really, um, I think, has been an incredibly productive moment. Now, this is not the end. Um, I want to remind everyone, I said at the beginning, we're now going to be going into the policy hackathon. It will be starting at quarter past the hour. I'll put it that way, depending on where you are. It is six past the hour right now, but at quarter past the hour, um, we will be going into the hackathon. Those of you uh, who've been watching this on live stream, stay with the same live stream. Uh, you will have an opportunity to continue engaging uh, and offering questions through the Slido function that you've already done. Those of you who've been joining this session through Zoom, uh, many of the Chatham House members and others who've been in through that platform, you've had in the chat line the link to follow to be able to now engage in the hackathon. It'll be, uh, you need to follow the links that were provided there. And also uh, there was a Slido link that you can use to be able to engage in the conversation as well. And this is gonna go on for two hours. So GMT uh, uh, from 1615 to 1815, at the end of which we should have some fascinating insights voted on with a jury, which are the best ideas as you always get with a hackathon on how NATO will adapt for all the big questions that we discussed today, uh, the values battle, the economic uh, as well as security resilience, the climate uh, challenge, uh, the technology uh, um, uh, disruption challenge, the interoperability and where NATO sits in the world. Um, again, let me just thank you, Secretary General, for uh, taking on so many of these ideas and engaging with these young NATO leaders. And again, I think uh, on my behalf and everyone's here, great job to the 14 young leaders putting together these, these great ideas in such a concentrated way. So that's it from me. Um, look forward to seeing you in the hackathon. Uh, go straight there, but it'll kick off at quarter past. Have a good, productive rest of your day. Thank you very much. Bye, bye uh, Jens. Thank Thanks you, Secretary so much, General. Thank you.